Hello, my name's Aubrey Weimark. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the Australasian um, Tektite Source Crater. This is one of the biggest remaining mysteries um, in the Tektite world. Um, there's a lot of indicative information as to where the Source Crater likely lies, and this limits the area where it could be to a relatively small area. We're going to look at each piece of evidence in this video and hopefully come to some kind of conclusion as to where the source crater likely is. Um, today I'm filming from the Middle East. Um, have a look out the window, got a nice view here in this hotel room. I'm working here. Guess where I am? Many people would have seen enough there to find out where I am. A nice swanky hotel room here. Okay, so what do we know about um, the Australasian Tektite strewn field? It, it's, it's one of the most recent and largest um, Tektite strewn fields on Earth, and yet um, we don't have a crater. Um, so, so what can we learn? Firstly, is there a crater? And secondly, if there is, where is it located? So let's look at other um, tektite strewn fields. Um, if we take the Central European strewn field, um, this is Moldavites. Um, these are coming from uh, Rise Impact Crater in Germany. Um, there's geochemical link established between the two and the age is the same. So we know that they come from uh, that source crater. Uh, we can also look at the morphologies and the distance they are from that uh, crater. Um, second, we have the, um, the North American tektites. Here I'm talking about Georgiaites and uh, Bediasites. Um, these also have a known source crater and this is Chesapeake impact crater. So um, we know the sizes of these craters, we know the distance they are from the tektites and the morphology of the tektites. So we can use this information to get an idea of roughly where the crater should be. So before we start, let's um, get rid of the notion that there is no crater. A, a few ideas have uh, come about that there has perhaps been an aerial burst and this has melted the rock and somehow um, either made the tektites basically in situ or sucked them into a mushroom cloud effectively and then distributed them. Um, th this is clearly not the case. There has been uh, a contact, there has been a crater formed. All tektites are basically um, a very similar composition. There are variants, but they are a similar composition within the Australasian strewn field. There's also an element of the impact uh, in them. So there is a very small component, often about 0.5% of the tektite is actually um, extraterrestrial material. So clearly the two have been mixed, not thoroughly mixed. Tektites are not well mixed, but the, the, there has been a component of the impactor incorporated. So the two have have come in contact. It's not just heat. Um, secondly, um, uh, with reference to Mung Nong type layered uh, impact glasses, um, they're, they're not related to the underlying geology or the soil beneath them. Clearly, um, the, there is a uh, source crater. They've come from the same place, basically. So somewhere we are looking for a source crater. The idea of an aerial burst and melting or um, sucking up of uh, silica-rich material into a uh, cloud is it, it, it's just not realistic. We, we can forget about that. That there is the source crater. So the question is where is this single source crater? So coming back to tektite morphologies, um, I, I think Chesapeake is the best one to use because um, the impact is likely of a comparable size to the Australasian uh, tektite strewn field. Um, so we have bediasites, these are um, very very similar to philippinites. Um, bediasites occur roughly 2,000 kilometers from the impact site. Um, Georgiaites, um, found in Georgia in uh, USA, 
the, these are um, much more proximal tech types. Um, I'm doing this off the top of my head, so I'm trying to think of the number, how far away um, they are from the Chesapeake uh, impact crater. But if I remember rightly, there's something in the order of um, 900 um, kilometers or 600 kilometers. I'll show you a map in a minute and, and we'll uh, we get the correct number there. But they're much more proximal. So we can see the difference in morphologies. Um, tectites from Georgia are very similar to Indochina. It's, you've got uh, disc shapes and flattened bodies. Um, and then if we compare um, Moldavites with um, uh, uh, the distance from their source crater, which I know is a slightly smaller crater, um, then um, again, most Moldavites are more disc shaped, teardrop shaped, flattened shapes. These are very proximal tectites, and, and these are in the order of three, four, five hundred kilometers away from the impact site. Okay, so here we have the um, Central European strewn field here. This is uh, Moldavites. So we have the uh, Nordlingerized crater here. This is a um, 20, 24 kilometer crater, I think. And um, the distance to the tectites is about 280 to, uh, let's say, 500 uh, kilometers from the uh, source. So, okay, if we zoom out, Let's go to the North American strewn field. So these are the um, blue colored uh, dots. This is the North American strewn field. Here's the Chesapeake um, impact crater. So um, here are the Georgia sites and here are the Badia sites. So let's see the distance here. So Georgia sites, they're about 660 to 930 kilometers um, from the impact site and the diocites which are comparable with Philippinites about 1950 to 2180 kilometers from the uh, source crater and then you have a few uh, sites where there's uh, microtectites and a few sites to the north so in this area you have the proximal um, tectites similar to Indochinites and over here you have the medial ones similar to Philippinites. So here's the Central American uh, strewn field. This is the probable crater here. It's about 560 kilom kilometers from the source crater. These are again proximal type uh, tectites. Here we have the um, Ivory Coast tectites. This is the Basumtui uh, crater, 10.5 kilometer diameter. And that's about 300 kilometers from the impact of the most tectites is some microtectites. I'm um, just going back to the Chesapeake crater. The uh, Chesapeake crater is about 85 kilometers diameter, although the original crater before slumping um, post impact would have been about 40 kilometers, which is comparable with what we'd anticipate in the Australasian tectite strewn field. So uh, let's zoom out. Um, we have a Darwin uh, crater glass down here tiny little strewn field not really true tectites um, borderline and all these black dots here this is the Australasian tectite strewn field um, so you've got this area here where you've got the um, proximal tectites in the Indo-Chinese region here we've got medial type tectites and then over here particularly in Australia distal type tectites and even get microtectites in Antarctica here very asymmetrical there so you've got the proximal type here and the distal here but obviously nothing up here uh, has ever been observed almost certainly doesn't exist so what does this tell us about the Australasian um, impact well if we look at um, Australian tectites now these were traveling at very high velocity in excess of five kilometers per second they're ablated bodies um, so these are the most distal tectites wherever the crater is these are the furthest away tectites from the crater um, if we move um, to the Philippines and to Malaysia to, uh, and Indonesia to uh, Belitung um, we have tectites which are very comparable 
um, to those found um, in Texas, the Badia sites. Now they're found about 1,900, 2,000 kilometers from the Chesapeake um, crater. So we might expect roughly similar values um, from the Australasian source crater. Next we move to the Indochinites um, and the Chinites. These are ones occurring in places like uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia um, and uh, China, Hainan, uh, Lizao Peninsula, uh, Guangdong and Gangxi. Um, now these uh, are very proximal tectites. These are comparable with Moldavites. They are comparable with Georgiaites. Now the, these these are clearly occurring within about a thousand kilometers of the impact so we can see that distribution so what we also note in the Australasian strewn field is a very asymmetrical distribution so we get them in one direction not in not 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 in all directions not in a radial uh, pattern okay so looking at the Australasian strewn field let's assume the crater is um, roughly here, it's, uh, it's going to be in this kind of area here. Let, let's, let's pick a spot here. Um, we can see that the proximal tectites, and these are all these ones, are within about 900 kilometers of the impact site. Um, they're likely to have a radial distribution. Now let, let's look at the more distal ones. These are comparable to the diocites, which are about 1,900 kilometers away. These would be about 1,400 to 2,300 kilometers away. Same better These are 2,200 kilometers away. These are uh, very typical medial tectites. This is really comparable number to what we get in the Chesapeake crater. Um, the distal tectites are over here in Australia. Um, we don't have any other craters to compare them with. Now, so let's look at the um, uh, ray pattern. Now, some people say there are no um, crater rays. Uh, admittedly, it's, it's difficult to recognize them, but clearly there are some patterns within the strewn field. The most obvious are in Australia, and let's pick on the um, ray which goes through Tasmania and Victoria. Um, this is uh, one of the most prominent rays, it's clearly a downrange ray. Um, so let's use this ray. There are other rays that go um, closer to Perth. Um, we'll just ignore them for now. I only need one ray that's on the downrange thing. And um, so we can take the, um, the, uh, the, the lineament of that ray and project back towards where the source might be. Um, now, you can do this fairly accurately. The um, Coriolis effect had very little impact because tectites were travelling so fast. You know, they flew to Australia in perhaps 15 minutes. So, um, they're, they're, they're not going to be heavily impacted, tens of kilometres uh, perhaps. And they're also going to be weathered and redistributed, but it's not going to heavily um, impact this pattern. Okay, so we we'll start with this ray here. This is the Victorian ray, it's probably other rays in Australia, this is probably the main downrange area here, possibly other ones here, but this was this is a very prominent ray. So let's use this uh, ray here, let's uh, take this, let's go roughly through here, there's probably some tectites here, so let's go through there, let's go up north. Now in Brunei there's a lot of tectites occurring, this ray could well pass through there. And we're getting to an area here. Um, perhaps a better fit might be slightly over here. So, say somewhere here. Maybe going through Brunei. Maybe a little bit here. Let's have it going through Brunei for now. Let's see how it works this end. Yeah, I mean, that's working pretty well for me. Somewhere there. There's obviously such distance there. That's 8,000 kilometers that line. Um, there's a margin of error here. Could you, you know, you're looking at somewhere here. But I think going through um, Brunei there is pretty good. Somewhere around there. Slightly to the right might be a better fit there. 
so it's uh, somewhere there anyway. Okay, and now let's uh, look for another crater ray. We're looking for a uh, something at right angles, and that will help um, define where the crater is. If we go to the Philippines, there is a very prominent ray. Um, it goes through the northern part of Metro Manila, through Quezon City, and uh, through the northern part of the Lake District, through the gold mining area, Paracale in Bicol, and then out into the Pacific Ocean. Now. Uh, it's perhaps less well defined because it's a smaller area, but nonetheless, it's it's a very prominent ray um, to such an extent that when I'm in the Philippines, you you can actually if somebody says, "Oh, I found a tectite it's roughly in this area," you can actually pretty much guess where it came from because you know that there are large areas where there's no tectites, and then they're following this lineament, this line. Um, so, so the tectite will be occurring roughly on that line. Next we're looking at this ray in the Philippines. It doesn't seem so obvious when you look at this, but when you actually look at abundances of uh, tectites, uh, it's in the northern part of Manila, this is a really prominent thing. Yeah, all the large tectites here in, coming from the Philippines in Paracale. Um, it, it actually has further proof that this is a strong ray it goes out all the way into the Pacific Ocean here. There's microtectites here. There's probably um, another ray coming through here. It's usually a concentration there. Um, so let's uh, take this one here. Um, well, let's actually start all the way in the Pacific Ocean here, since we've got some samples here. So it probably comes through here. It's coming through all them lines there we could be more accurate there but um, say roughly like that it's quite a good um, line there so it came through there so it's giving us a rough area where we might expect the crater remember this one was more that so we perhaps somewhere this line's probably more accurate because it's closer so somewhere in this area here perhaps possibly over here but it's certainly in this kind of area um, maybe we could try and plot this Ray. There seems to be a, a possible ray. I have to save that. So um, let's uh, see where this this goes here. We seem to have a feature going through there. These are the ones which I'm more confident about here. Somewhere through here, probably going through Paswanga. I mean, th this is a lot less prominent ray, um, but there's, there seems to be something going through there anyway. We won't use that one. Um, but there's also the other Australasian ones, remember? Again, not quite as good, but seeming to trend there. That's 341 degrees, so if we uh, keep 341, that's roughly here. So. We're building up a picture here, you can see. Um, it, it's not not precise, it's definitely a marginal error, but it's looking as if this kind of area here is most likely. So now we have two crater rays, um, one um, in Australia, the Victorian Tasmanian one, and the other running through Metro Manila and Paracale and out into the Pacific Ocean. Now we can regress those lines and they're roughly at right angles so let's see where they meet. Um, and, and where they meet is um, roughly somewhere in the Indo-Chinese area. Um, so we're looking at somewhere um, either in the Gulf of Tonkin or uh, Vietnam or Laos, somewhere in this area. It's not totally precise, but it's giving us a general area of uh, where we should be looking. So earlier I remarked on the morphology. So what we're looking for is the proximal tectites. Now the most proximal type of tectites, the lowest temperature, lowest pressure tectites, are the Mung Nong type impact glasses. So you would expect the source crater to be 
in close proximity to where we find this type of tektite. Also where we find the classic splash form type Indochinites and Chinites is going to be in this area. Now these forms of tektites, these are some of the last forms so we're going to be expecting a little bit more of a radial distribution here rather than the uh, bilateral symmetry butterfly kind of pattern that we get on the more distal ejecta. So clearly we get, we're looking in this area in Indochina and China and the Gulf of Tonkin. This, this is where we're looking. Now, interestingly, the distribution of tektites um, is really all on the eastern side of the Indochinese Peninsula. If you go to the western side, there are no tektites. Yet the tektites are still occurring over in Hainan or Lezao Peninsula. So you need to get a roughly symmetrical um, pattern. So um, you're looking for some way midway on that. So we're very much looking again at the Gulf of Tonkin or somewhere um, on the eastern part of uh, the Indo-Chinese uh, Peninsula. We can also take a microtectite distribution and numbers. Basically, as you move further away from the impact crater, there are going to be uh, fewer and fewer microtectites. Obviously, the distribution is not even because there are crater rays, um, but um, you, you can you can uh, do a pattern to move in. Now, some of the problem with these. Um, uh, models is that all the data is from one side. You don't get microtectites on land. Um, they're simply um, they're, they're basically dissolved away when they're in contact with fresh water. So we're only finding them in the oceans and then only really in the deep oceans. So it's, it's not a great um, even source of data but taking what we've got and then regressing back. Again we're looking at somewhere regressing towards the Indo-Chinese Peninsula and more towards the eastern side or the even going further north. I think often these programs regress too far back to the north simply because of the lack of the lack of data um, in, in, in the northern part of the strewn field. Uh, some people say that um, you don't get crater um, ejector rays um, on Earth. Um, th this is clearly not the case. I mean, even in small impacts, you can see um, you can see ejector uh, rays occurring. Um, large ejector rays that cover a large amount of the planet. Um, of course, these are suppressed by the atmosphere. The thicker the atmosphere, the more they're going to be suppressed. So they're not going to be exactly the same as what you find on the moon or on Mercury, where there effectively is no atmosphere. But nonetheless, you will find crater rays on Earth. In a very large asteroid impact, the atmosphere is extremely thin and it will have a very limited um, effect on, on, the, on the crater ray formation. Basically, the tektites are forming above the bulk of the atmosphere anyway. Um, so so we, we can expect to see crater rays and this is exactly what we do see. So what we can do is crater ray regression. Um, we take every known locality of uh, tektites and we regress them back to potential source craters or source areas. Um, it doesn't have to be a crater or a feature. You can regress them to anywhere on the globe and see what makes sense. Now, we're assuming that crater rays occur and therefore what we're looking for is an overlap in regression lines. Um, I will show you a number of maps. What we're uh, also looking for is, so we're looking for the best overlap, we're looking for the best symmetry. Expect the distal tektites to have a bilateral symmetry. Expect the proximal tektites to have perhaps more of a radial symmetry. We're looking for symmetry. Any pattern should be reasonably symmetrical. So overlay, forming rays and symmetry. So wherever the crater is, we can look for the best fit pattern. Now, 
I'll run through a few of these uh, uh, patterns next. But clearly, the crater again lies either in the Gulf of Tonkin or on the eastern side of Indochina. Okay, let's do some tektite regression. All these black dots represent um, fine localities. Um, the variable quality, um, but, but most are accurate, the, the worst are being removed. So what we can do is regress um, these points to a potential crater or potential source area. So let's start, this is Storfer 1978. Um, what we're looking for with these lines, we, we're expecting rays, so we want to see the maximum amount of overlap possible in producing these, and we also want to see a radial sim, a radial symmetry in the in the um, proximal area, and then a bilateral symmetry in the medial and distal areas. So let's run through some of this. Um, this is Hartung and Rivolo. 1978, 1979. Let's remove that last one. Okay. Walter Schnetzler. Various. I keep forgetting to remove the last one. You can see this is not working well in terms of symmetry, this one. And this one definitely is not working well. All your proximal tectites are up here. Um, it just doesn't work well. Symmetry. There's not a lot of overlap with uh, the data, it's, uh, it's not good. Okay, Walter and Schnetzer again. Schnetzer, Walter and Marsh. Burns in Glass, 1989. That really doesn't work. You can see it's totally asymmetrical. You're clearly in the wrong area there. Part time 1990, I think, uh, and 1994, I think this is Tonle Sub. Again, um, too asymmetrical, it, it just, uh, in that proximal area, it doesn't work. In terms of overlap, not working particularly well. Um, it, 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 it's, it's too much um, to the west there. Schnetzler and Garvin, 1992. Again, Schnetzler and Garvin, 1992. Schnetzler, 1992. Um, much better. You can see uh, this line's a bit darker, more overlap, suggesting it's it's in a better position there. Zoom in a little bit here so we can see more overlap. Glass, 1993. Uh, two, two asymmetrical doesn't work there. Got a lot here. Um, Schmidt and Watson, um, 1993. Again. Too much asymmetry, not enough overlap, these are not forming nice lines, that's not the right place. Glass and uh, Pizzuto, uh, 1994, again asymmetrical. Hildebrand, asymmetrical. Chalcedon and Kobo, I apologise if I'm pronouncing these names wrong. Um, pronunciation is not the best thing, but um, yeah, okay, again, the, the, this location is just simply not working. Um, these lines are not overlapping well where they should be, and um, there's no symmetry here um, where there shouldn't be. So, we keep going through. That's not bad, see? Look, look at that overlap there. That's exactly what you want to see. These are much better lines. So this is clearly a much more, this is much closer to where the source crater is. I mean, that's more workable, far more workable. Again, not, not so bad here. There's a slight amount of asymmetry here, more over here than there. But, um, working okay. Been working reasonably well. Schnetzer and McCone, these ones are 1996. Das and Glass, 1999. Again, not bad. Um, you're certainly in probably the right area there. Schnetzer, this. Uh, in that here, it's, it's, it doesn't work. Um, that, that's clearly the wrong area there. B and V, uh, 2000. Again, not working. This is just too asymmetrical. The, you see, you lose this overlap. You expect uh, you expect these lines to be overlapping as much as possible because tectites are occurring on ejector rays. Glass uh, a bit better. Not not perfect. Too much asymmetry here. But you've got no no 
tectites here uh, and tectites over here. It's it's too far this way. Ma et al. 2001, 2004. Now this this is looking very good. You can see the sharpness of these lines. Um, the, the, this is looking much much better. Glass and cobalt. It, you can see this just doesn't work. Um, it's it's all downrange. Where's the where's the proximal radial distribution? There's nothing up here. There's no tectites up here. Um, this is not working for me. It's the wrong place. Facade 2007. Again, too much asymmetry. Not working. Uh, Trinca 2009. Okay, this is much better. Um, it's certainly in approximately the right area. Um, this is Weimark, this is me 2013, I'm going to be biased here, but again a lot of good overlap here, again very promising here. Um, Kenkman 2014, let's turn that other one off, uh, again too much asymmetry, this is not working, not a lot of overlap there. So I mean in terms of the best fit, you are really looking at ones like um, my one Y mark, although to be honest, there's not enough tectites over here. There's an asymmetry, but then again, this is mainly ocean, and that could account for it. Um, Trinker 2009 is pretty good um, in the, in that kind of area. Mar et al. Uh, pretty good. I mean, really, you're looking at this kind of area here. This is clearly where the crater is, either in the Gulf of Tonkin in the middle here or on land in the central Vietnam to Laos. Um, the, the closer to the coast, um, the more likely. Probably where my hand is there, that's probably pretty much the best place. Certainly somewhere in this area is where the regression lines indicate. One other thing we can look at is um, Mung Nong type tectites. The distribution of these, obviously these are very proximal uh, tectites, these are going to be closest to the impact. We can also look at the um, the uh, chemical variations within the Mung Nong tectites and I, I'll show you a paper in a minute and a map and um, these can be used to kind of regress and uh, uh, find a sensible location for the source crater. Glass chemistry, you can only make glass out of a certain type of rock and that rock has to be a silica rich rock. Now typically silica is not occurring in very high um, quantities, you need concentration methods um, in order to get high quantities of uh, silica and this primarily is the weathering of rock and then the transportation and redeposition of rock. So tectites are really, firstly only going to really occur on geologically active planets that have an atmosphere. So within our solar system, the only real sources of proper high quality large volumes of tectites is Earth and then secondary um, on Mars could probably produce um, some quantities of tectites. Now, um, here obviously we're looking at earth, so what we're looking at is sedimentary or metasedimentary rocks. So things like siltstone, claystone, sandstone, shale, or the metamorphic equivalents of these rocks. Things like schist and gneiss. Um, uh, these are the type of silica rich rocks which can actually form glass. If you impact uh, a rock which is much poorer in silica, you will not produce glass, you will not produce a tectite. So this sets a constraint on where the crater can be. Now, um, these type of uh, silica-rich uh, sedimentary rocks, they're most classically occurring on continental shelf areas. So effectively the rock is eroded from mountains and from land and is deposited on the continental shelf. So this is the most likely place for um, a tectite source crater. Um, not all craters will produce tectites, by the way, because it, if, the, if the impact is on the wrong type of rock, uh, uh, something which is lower in silica, it won't produce tectites.
Okay, so two classic papers are by Ma et al. Um, and and his first one was in 2001. Um, I think the more comprehensive one was in 2004. Um, these are really a must read if you're looking for the crater. Um, what they're looking at is um, the concentration of the beryllium uh, 10, particularly in Mangnong uh, type layered tektites. Um, now what we are expecting is that um, as you move towards the crater, basically the material is the last form, deepest excavated material. So you would expect a lower concentration of beryllium-10. Beryllium-10 is a cosmogenic isotope. Um, it, it has a half-life of uh, 1.39 million years. This is a very short half-life geologically. So um, older sediment should contain a lot less, if any, um, beryllium-10. So we basically plot the iso concentrations and then you get to a point where you have the lowest concentration and that's where your crater should lie. Um, so um, in Maratau uh, 2004 they did this and they're plotting the potential crater position in the Gulf of Tonkin um, towards the um, Vietnamese side. Now the next uh, classic paper is uh, Blum et al. Now this is a 1992 paper, there's another smaller abstract in 1991. Now they looked at uh, neodymium and strontium isotopes, they looked at rubidium strontium isotopes. Now with the rubidium strontium, um, what they concluded basically was um, a Jurassic age for the source rock. So the rubidium strontium uh, clock was last reset roughly 170 million years ago so middle Jurassic so the assumption is a middle Jurassic source rock now if you think back to Mar et al now this conflicts with their data um, the, the tektites they contain beryllium 10 uh, a Jurassic rock cannot contain this beryllium 10 it has a 1.39 million year half-life so um, how, how are they together well the conclusion is possibly they are thoroughly mixed. So you have a Jurassic source rock and then the beryllium 10 is occurring near the surface in the soils and these are thoroughly mixed. Unfortunately, tektites are not well mixed and we, we can see this in the Mung Nong layered tektites. Um, for instance, these are really not well mixed at all and in, in all tektites in fact, um, they are pretty much shock melted. I, I doubt they are very significantly mixed. There is some mixing, but you even get bicolored tektites. Um, this is how poorly mixed they are. You can see uh, layering and flow lines. I just don't believe that they are very thoroughly mixed. So now you have a problem because you have a conflict in age. Blum is saying effectively a middle Jurassic age. Um, the beryllium 10 content is saying either thorough mixing or your rock is a lot younger age. Fortunately there is a solution to this problem because um, the two are compatible. Rubidium strontium uh, age is not necessarily reset. So if you have a situation where you have very rapid deposition, particularly say in a deltaic environment, what you can do is rapid weathering and deposition, the rubidium strontium clock is effectively not reset. So I think that that's probably what we're seeing here. And this will explain the beryllium 10 content and with rapid deposition, um, you can explain away the rubidium strontium. So the two can be uh, compatible with one another. In fact, what we see with the beryllium 10 content is you still get quite high abundances, even in the very proximal last excavated tectites, the deepest excavated tectites, effectively the Mung Nong and the splash form tectites in Indochina. It's a lower beryllium 10 content than the first form tectites, the Australasian uh, tectites. But what this is um, tentative, tentatively suggesting is that actually you have a very thick column of rapidly deposited rock. So let, let's get this again. Um, we, we've got a silica rich rock, something like sandstone, siltstone, um, 
probably very rapidly deposited, um, maybe a deltaic type environment. Um, there was recently a paper, um, this would be 2019 Ackerman, and he was suggesting that um, probably seawater played a, uh, played a uh, role in this as well. So we're perhaps looking at a, a, a shallow sea to deltaic type environment um, with um, sandstones, siltstones, claystones, mixture of that type of rock. Um, very, very rapidly deposited. Um, a very thick column of uh, Pleistocene, Pliocene, Miocene uh, sediment. So this is probably what we're uh, going to have to be looking for. Okay, we can limit things a little bit more because the crater is going to it's definitely going to be on either the eastern coast, eastern part of Indochina, or in the Gulf of Tonkin. So um, let, let, let's look as if it was on land. If it's on land, what would we expect it to look like? Well, firstly, we'd expect a circular or near circular crater. Um, if we look at some um, so, some other te uh, some other craters which formed at a similar time to um, 786,000 years. Um, let, let's firstly look at um, Bosomtui crater. It's very comparable. It's about 10.5 kilometer diameter crater. It's in a, um, a tropical or subtropical area. Um, it's, uh, it's basically forming a circular lake. And, and this is what happens in, in a very tropical uh, climate. You, you get a lake forming. Um, look at Lonar Crater in India. That's also a lake. Um, we, we, we have a bit of a problem here because um, if we look at Indochina, there are no obvious um, 40 kilometer um, diameter circular lakes. I mean, the closest we get to that is uh, a place called Tonle Sab in Cambodia. Um, in 1994, Hartung et al. Uh, suggested this could possibly be the crater. But when we look at the tectite distribution and also regression of the rays, unfortunately, the, this just doesn't fit as a candidate for the crater. The, the crater cannot be here. Um, so, okay, we're looking for a um, 40 kilometer circular lake. It's simply not on land. How do you get rid of it? You could erode it away. But let's remember, this crater is 786,000 years old. This, this is not old geologically. It's going to have effects many kilometers down um, easily, a few, three, four kilometers down or more. You're going to be seeing the impact effects. You just simply can't erode this much of sediment in, in, in this short period of time. Yes, you could probably erode hundreds of uh, meters, but that, that that's about it. You, you're just going to scrape the surface there. So, okay, it's, it's not on land. Um, nowhere obvious there. So, let's move over to the uh, Gulf of Tonkin. Is this uh, a possibility? Um, ab absolutely, because if you can't erode a crater, the other way of hiding it is to bury it. And um, in this situation, in, in the Yinghai Basin or Song Hong Basin, if you're in Vietnam, um, this is some of the highest sedimentation rates in the world. You can easily bury a crater with half a kilometre of sediment um, in, in this very brief interval. So I think that this is, all the indicators are, this crater's not on land. If it was on land, we'd know about it. There'd be a huge circular depression and that would be filled with a volume of water. It's obviously under the sea um, and, and most likely under the sea and buried with a significant amount of sediment. So we have a potential source area, the Songhong Basin, Yinghai Basin. Um, so let's look for features in this uh, basin. It has been heavily explored for hydrocarbons. There are economic quantities of gas in this area. So um, people have written 
um, about this feature. It's it's a uh, it, it's a double-edged uh, sword, really. I mean, it's having hydrocarbons there it's going to mean there is exploration it's going to mean there is data but unfortunately it's also going to mean there is money and, and therefore some of the data will be confidential and it won't be shared we saw this with the discovery of the Chicxulub crater where Pemex did not initially um, uh, share the uh, gravity data I believe it was with um, the public so a crater was recognized but it wasn't shared so what data do we have in the Gulf of Tonkin? Well, we have uh, seismic data. The whole place is shot through with uh, seismic lines, um, seismic in search of uh, hydrocarbons, in search, search of structures that could potentially trap gas there. Um, we've got gravity anomaly data, the gravity anomaly maps taken uh, by satellite. Um, we have um, wells drilled, um, looking for hydrocarbons, um, none actually over the um, area of primary interest, but um, these potentially have sample data, they potentially have um, electronic log data, although it's going to be relatively near surface, so this data might not have been gathered. And then finally we have geological maps that may be based on all of that data and that have been published. So we can have a look at these uh, geological maps which perhaps plot the distribution of, sh distribution of shale diapies, sediment thicknesses based on seismic data, based on well data. So we can pour over these uh, maps even if we can't get hold of the primary data maybe we can get a kind of summary of the data that is available. Now the um, first thing that struck me when I started studying some of the papers from the Gulf of Tonkin were the uh, shale diapirs. Now where, where you get very rapidly deposited um, sediment and you get over pressure um, in a fixed sediment sequence, what you get is um, some areas of rock moving up. Now um, th these can also be potential uh, hydrocarbon traps as well so they are of interest um, they're distorting the sediments above and around. So um, looking at the distribution of these, these are interpreted as being related to the uh, pull apart basin um, in the Gulf of Tonkin and um, it's considered a north-south alignment but if you look at them, particularly on some of the older papers, um, you can almost discern a circular kind of pattern, a ring-like pattern. Now, um, th this is of interest because if you think back to the um, Chicxulub crater, you have uh, sea notes uh, uh, developed around the crater rim. So could this possibly be a reflection of the crater rim or of a shock wave. Certainly there does seem to be a kind of circular or semi-circular pattern to these features. Now whether or not these are a clue or whether or not these are anything to do with impact it, it is another matter. I mean most likely these are secondary but perhaps they are following lines of weakness. It's pointing in a certain direction at any rate. Now I've not been able to obtain a lot of the seismic, but some of this seismic data um, uh, produced by uh, the Chinese has been used to construct maps um, and maps of different stratigraphic layers. And one very telling thing, and it's been repeated in, in many papers, I'll show you the original one, is an area of um, chaotic sediment. Now this starts, I believe, in the late Miocene and goes into the Pliocene, getting wider and then, uh, then up, but basically up to the age of where we'd expect the uh, crater to have formed. Um, and you find this chaotic uh, pattern of sediment. There's basically a question mark there, a circle and a question mark, chaotic seismic. So anywhere where we're going to see chaotic seismic at the correct age in a broad circular pattern, this is going to be ringing alarm bells to me, particularly if it's in the correct area. So um, 
it makes me want to go back to the original data because very often in geology things can be interpreted differently um, so when I see a clue or a pattern what I always want to go is go back to the raw data have a look at that review it see if there is anything there see if there is another interpretation so I'd like to get hold of that seismic unfortunately I've not been able to So one seismic line that has been published, it's in very low resolution because it's found in a paper and unfortunately I don't have the original, but this line potentially crosses uh, part of the crater, um, if there is a crater there, um, and part of this chaotic seismic. So when I look at it, and, and I do look at seismic quite often, but I am not a geophysicist and I'm not qualified uh, to do this. When I look at it, I, I can see potential clues and consistencies because what I've done is I've gone back and looked at um, seismic data from other craters, um, particularly Chesapeake crater, but also other craters, and see if, if it's consistent with those craters. And from what I'm seeing, um, I, I think this uh, seismic needs a second look. Um, there certainly seems to be interesting features there. So having identified this um, area of interest, this uh, chaotic seismic, um, I went to try and find some gravity anomaly data. Now there's some available on GeoMap app, which is publicly available, fairly low resolution uh, data. I went to a company in the UK um, called GTech, and they were very kind in uh, providing me data to um, uh, to have a look at this specific area that I was interested in and very close to the area that I'd identified within about say 25 kilometers um, we, we see this potentially circular feature this was based on the 2012 data that I was provided um, subsequently I've got some higher resolution data it's basically got extra satellite data laid on top so that the the net effect is um, a higher resolution now when I look at that 2017 data which was published in 2018 um, unfortunately I'm, I'm losing a lot of that circular feature I was seeing in the lower resolution data so um, this is unfortunate maybe it's indicating there is nothing here um, not necessarily so I still think it's it's worth uh, doing further research in this area for sure if the crater's not in this um, specific area where I think it is, it's certainly within 125 kilometres of, of this proposed area. So it, it's in this vicinity, that's for sure. Okay, so we also have um, another source of information, and this is wells that are actually drilled in the Gulf of Tonkin. Now, I, I don't get too excited about this, because firstly, the data is going to be confidential, probably very hard to come by. Secondly, no wells have been drilled in the specific area I'm interested in, although one could theoretically study the thickness of the ejector blanket and work out where um, the crater likely lies. Um, the problem is, is that this is always going to be fairly shallow. Um, it, it's probably in the order of 300, 400, 500, 600 foot maybe, uh, sorry, meters um, below the um, uh, seabed. Um, uh, often 
this this data is not even collected. So um, I think the probability of getting any actual samples or probability of even wireline logs, um, electronic logs across this interval is probably relatively low. It may exist and if it does exist it could potentially form an interesting um, uh, thing. What you would take is, is numerous wells and uh, identify basically what is the ejector blanket either on samples or on logs and, and look at the thickness. Um, obviously it's going to be thicker closer to the crater. I don't think we're going to get any information there but it's potentially available. Um, next what we can do is we can look at published maps um, that are based on geological data um, primarily on seismic but also perhaps incorporating gravity data also potentially incorporating actual drilling data um, and, and geological maps that are drawn up in the Gulf of Tonkin now these can be very very um, revealing particularly the ones based on seismic um, so we, we will have a look at um, this data as well So where do we go from here? We have a lot of circumstantial evidence which to me strongly suggests there is a large 40 kilometer diameter or thereabouts crater in the Gulf of Tonkin in the center of the Yinghai Basin. Um, where do we go from there? How do we prove this or disprove this? Uh, well, the first thing I would do is get the seismic data. Seismic data does exist and goes directly across the centre of the crater. This is exactly what you need. We need to have a look at that crater. I believe it's Chinese owned. It's on the um, Vietnamese side of the agreed uh, maritime border. Although notably that stops just about where the um, potential crater is. So we need to have a review of the seismic data go back to the raw data have a look at it see if we can see anything or reinterpret something which may have been missed simply because it's a very large feature or simply because people are not looking or believe there could be an impact crater in this area so it's being misinterpreted so go back to that seismic data find that seismic data and review it this is gonna either rule out an impact or suggest that maybe we need to go a step further. So the next step is going to be to drill the structure. Without drilling the structure, without getting hands-on samples, we won't be able to prove anything. So um, seismic data first, drill the structure second. Um, I believe there is a crater out there. I believe it probably is where I'm saying it is. If it's not, it's certainly in close proximity to this. All the data is indicating um, a very consistent area in the central part of the Yinghai Basin. It's within 125 kilometers for sure of this um, proposed impact site. So we need to find this crater. I think it's, um, it, it, it's of great significance to understand this event understand it in terms of um, how it impacted or didn't impact the environment. Also, it occurred during a time when Homo erectus was living in China. So how did it affect humans? I mean, this is a huge event and yet it seems to have relatively little impact. Maybe studying the crater can give us more clues. So if you have any um, views or opinions or you want to discuss anything, um, there are um, Tektite forums on Facebook, uh, Tektite Collectors Group or Tektites Group, uh, that's the one that I run. Um, I, I'm on all of these so uh, um, have a look there and um, ask some questions. I think it's uh, of vital importance that we find this impact crater. We know the general area. We just need the data, and I'm sure the data does exist.